That concludes the time that we have today for member statements. It's now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My first question this morning is to the Premier. This morning, families from across Ontario are gathering here at Queen's Park. They're here to honour the memory of the loved ones who died in long-term care uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and to ensure that there is accountability for a system that so badly failed their parents and grandparents. That hasn't happened in Ontario. No minister has been held to account by the Premier. The Premier has not taken responsibility. And last week we learned that the Premier is planning, a new, uh, planning some new legislation to ensure that for-profit long-term care homes will be freed from legal liability for their actions. Their question, the people who are gathering today on the lawns of Queen's Park, their question to the Premier is, will anyone be held accountable for the failures in long-term care? I recognize the Premier to reply. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear that the system in Ontario has been broken and we must act quickly. It's been broken for 15 years as the opposition uh, leader stood by and did absolutely nothing to support long-term care. And we've been very clear that we'll review the long-term care system once we get through this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, we announced that we will be launching an independent commission in July. We will get down to the bottom of this. We'll be finalizing details of the commission, including terms of reference, membership, leadership of the commission, and the reporting timelines. We aren't going to wait years, as the previous government did and the previous uh, opposition uh, folks uh, did, or the present, I should say, opposition folks uh, did, Mr. Speaker. We're going to make sure we get answered answers for the loved ones. There is going to be accountability. Response. And we'll get down to the bottom of this. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the only thing the people of Ontario deserve is a true judicial public inquiry. That's what they're asking for. That's what they need, not a government-controlled commission. However, families are angry. Families are very angry that for, uh, private for-profit care homes did little to protect the lives of their loved ones. Facilities like Orchard Villa have kept their license even after the Canadian Armed Forces found seniors living amongst cockroaches and mice while they were in soiled diapers the whole time. Families repeatedly called for the for-profit provider uh, to respond. They called the for-profit provider and the government for help. They were ignored. Their question today is, why is the government protecting for-profit long-term care faci facilities from legal liability rather than pulling licenses from the homes that have so brutally failed our seniors? Premier. Well, well, through you, Mr. Speaker, our top priority has been protecting the safety of the most, most vulnerable, especially the residents in long-term care. That's why in, in January, Mr. Speaker, we made COVID-19 a reportable disease, implemented our COVID-19 action plan, issued three emergency orders, introduced two packages of amended regulations, announced $243 million in emergency funding to support 24-7 screening, additional staffing, enhanced cleaning, and additional surge capacity. It's why last year we conducted over 2,800 inspections. Upon receiving the report from CAF, I announced an immediate investigation into all code red homes and all of those underway or complete with orders and notices being issued. Right now, 63 homes are in outbreak out of the 626 homes. 252 homes are resolved. Response. All, all, in the hands, are, all hands are on deck to stabilize those worst hit homes. And the final supplement. And, Speaker, if I may, 2,003 lives lost. If that was the Premier's priority, he certainly failed at it. The people joining us today did everything that they could, everything in their power that they could to protect their loved ones. They called management at facilities like Orchard Villa and Camilla Care only to be ignored. They wrote the Premier. They even called his office every hour for three days straight in May and never got a reply. Now they see the Premier springing into action, but not to help them and their families, Speaker. Not to help them and their families. Why is the Premier so eager to help the for-profit long-term care homes that failed these families? 
Mr. Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the, the question to the member opposite. Our government has been committed to the long-term care system, to the reform, to the transformation ever since we began. It began with a commitment to rebuild, to advance long-term care, and to fix the problems that had existed for many, many years under the previous Liberal, Liberal government supported by the opposition. That is what we've been doing. We've been addressing the issues of neglect for many decades and 15 years. We looked at how we can improve the capacity in our long-term care homes, how we can improve the staffing. And one of the first things we did at the outbreak of the pandemic was call to make sure that homes had the su support that they needed. Nobody was prepared for the aggressive, infectious nature of COVID-19 that had wreaked havoc around the world with no knowledge of how it works, how it spreads, or how it moves. Response? That evidence is evolving. And we're taking measures every day to advance our long-term care system and fix the problem left behind by the previous government. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Last week, the Minister said, and I quote, new thinking is required when it comes to fixing problems in the long-term care system. New thinking should mean seniors shouldn't have to wait a week or even more to have a bath. New thinking should mean clean, respectable, comfortable places to live, not homes infested with mice and cockroaches. New thinking should mean that families aren't left protesting on the lawn just to be heard. It shouldn't mean that private for-profit corporations that fail to protect our seniors should be shielded from legal action. How can the Premier claim he's protecting seniors when the only people being protected are the ones who helped create this tragedy in the first place? Minister of Long-Term Care, to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. The solutions that are required for the long-term care system that we need for the 21st century are many. There is not one solution. There will be many solutions required. And when we try to look at the system across the board, there's no particular type of operation that's at fault. There was a duty to maintain the standard of care in all our long-term care homes. That was non, not negotiable. And certainly, with the commission, an independent, nonpartisan, public commission, with public hearings, public input, a public report, we will get to the bottom of this. This is a tragedy across the world. And I'm taking measures now as the Minister of Long-Term Care preceding the pandemic to modernize long-term care, to make it ready and responsive to the needs of our aging population, which is Response. rapidly increasing in number. We know what needs to be done, what your government didn't do. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, last week, the Minister of Long-Term Care said, and I quote, the duty of care of our long-term care homes is non-negotiable. They must keep our residents safe. That's what she said. 66 long-term care homes still have an outbreak as of yesterday afternoon. Seven of those facilities lost a quarter or more of their residents to COVID-19. For every four seniors in their care, one senior has died. If these long-term care facilities are supposed to be keeping residents safe rather than allowing this horrible virus to spread, why are they allowed to keep their licenses and why is the minister allowed to keep her job? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. And again, I, I appreciate your question. When we understand the issue at the crux of the problem, it is years of neglect that cannot be turned around in a matter of, of days or weeks. We were a strained system, according to Justice Galise, who reported in the summer of 2019, exactly the same time when the new Ministry of Long-Term Care was created. COVID broke that system. When we look across the board and we understand how 80%, 70 to 80% are, of our homes were not in outbreak. And an outbreak, we reduced that definition to mean one case, even one case of a staff member who is uh, self-isolating at home potentially no cases in the home whatsoever. We need to understand the facts, and the truth matters, the facts matter, and we will get to the bottom of this with a public 
independent, nonpartisan commission. It, and Response. we have committed to that. It will be done, and we will be announcing uh, more about that in the coming weeks. I appreciate your concern. The final supplement, please. Well, Speaker, other provinces did much better in protecting their seniors. For example, we have a province that had only 160-odd deaths because they actually did do the work in advance of COVID hitting long-term care, where our province did not. This minister and this premier did not, no matter how many times they were saying that they were putting an iron ring around long-term care. They were not doing that, notwithstanding the report that the minister talks about that she received back last year from the horrors that happened in the murders that the wet law for, uh, case uh, un unveiled. But look, the families who are here at Queen's Park, Speaker, they were failed by this government. The Premier, as I said, promised that iron ring and then ignored their calls, literally ignored their calls for help as their parents and loved ones were left to suffer in conditions that no one should ever have to live in. Now, once again, he's putting the interests of for-profit providers and political allies ahead of the needs of families. Will the Premier do the right thing? Stop protecting the for-profit homes. Stop protecting cabinet ministers and offer real accountability to families who have, have endured so much pain because he has failed to protect them in long-term care. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. So let's look at the facts. For 15 years, for Order. 15 years, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, failed to address the problems that led to the crisis in long-term care with COVID-19. When you refer to uh, other provinces, let's understand the facts. In BC, between 2013 and 2017, a population of that province, one-third of Ontario's, they built 900 beds. 900 beds for one-third the population. In Alberta, since 2014, they've built 1,227, and that's the reason why. They, they managed better. They had better capacity because Order. the previous government took measures during that time to keep up with an aging population. The previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, Response. did nothing of the sort. They also neglected a staffing crisis. I suggest the Leader of the Opposition may want to take her own advice. Thank you. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is also for the Premier. Ijaz Chowdhury was a 62-year-old father of four from Malton. He was experiencing a mental health crisis, so his family called the paramedics for help. Instead, he was shot dead by police in his own home. Ijaz Chowdhury, like DeAndre Campbell, like Regis Korshinsky paquette and like Caleb Tubila and Joko, was loved and valued. They all needed help and should all be alive today. They should have gotten the help and be alive today. How many more people in mental health crisis have to die during interactions with the police for this Premier to take responsibility and do something about it? The Premier. Well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to reassure the family of the loved ones of Ijaz Chaudhry and the people of Ontario that effective, reasonable and independent police oversight is one of my top priorities. And as I mentioned in my press conference yesterday, my prayers, my thoughts, my condolences go out to their family. The SIU is an independent, arm's-length civilian oversight body, and I do have confidence in the SIU. They investigate deaths, serious injuries, and allegations of sexual assault that may occur when police are involved. They have the sole discretion, and I say the sole discretion, to decide whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that a criminal offence has been committed in the cause and, and charges to be laid. All decisions are rendered without interference from the public, the police, or the government. Thank you. The supplementary question, a member for Brampton East. My question is to the Premier. Ajaz Daldri was a 62-year-old man from Malton. He was suffering from a mental health crisis, so his family decided to call the paramedics for help. When the police arrived, they used a ladder to break into his apartment. With guns drawn and screaming, they shot and killed Ajaz Chaudhry in his own home while he was alone. 
His seven-year-old son is still asking when his father is going to come back from the hospital. How many more people are going to have to die? How many more people are going to be shot and killed by the police? How many more people who are suffering from mental health crises are going to be shot and killed when all they needed is help? The family deserves answers. We all deserve answers. Will the Premier commit to an independent public inquiry into the death of Mr. Chaudhry? Premier, to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, my heart goes out again to the family of loved ones, to anyone in these tragic situations. We know that more needs to be done to tackle the mental health crisis in our communities. That's why we've invested over $3.8 billion with the cooperation of the federal government. We recognize that the nature of policing and community safety has changed, especially when it comes to those with complex, complex mental health needs. Last year, our government made a $174 million commitment to address mental health and addiction challenges. Over $18 million of that new funding was specifically designated to those affected by mental health and addiction challenges in the justice sector alone, Mr. Speaker. We also invested nearly $7 million for new mobile crisis teams designated to bring together the police officer with a mental health professional to provide care for the people in crisis. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question today is for the Premier. Premier, yesterday was an exciting day for the province with the announcement of Toronto and Peel regions that they would be entering stage two reopening this coming week. I can only imagine the excitement and sense of relief for the people of Toronto and the people in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore hearing this news. For businesses, both large and small, this is a very welcoming announcement as they restart their operations to serve in these communities once again. But Ontarians can ensure that every time our government makes a decision, it is always based on the best available medical and scientific advice. This is always done to ensure the betterment of all Ontarians while protecting their health and their safety. With that in mind, Speaker, can the Premier share with the Legislature more about this next phase of reopening and how it will benefit the residents of Toronto, the people of Etobicoke Lakeshore, Peel, and all of Ontario? The Premier. Well, I want to thank the fantastic, excellent member from the great state of Etobicoke Lakeshore. She's doing a great, great job. When, when more regions uh, move into phase two, Mr. Speaker, it means one thing. We're all doing our part. It's amazing what can get done when you're all pulling in the same direction, no matter what political stripe you're from. When we all do our part, more people across the province can go back to work, more people are taking home a paycheck, and more people are able to put food on the table. That's why yesterday we announced that we are reopening Peel in Toronto. That means restaurants, bars can reopen their patios, beauty salons and barbershops can start talking, taking appointments, and shopping malls can open their doors once again. But that wouldn't be possible, Mr. Speaker, without the support of the 14 and a half million people of this great province. And we're going to continue opening up. I'm not comfortable until all of Ontario opens up. That includes our great friends in Windsor, Essex. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, and thank you, Premier, for that answer. I know the people in my riding really do appreciate that. Although this is a welcome news for the people, people of Toronto and Peel, I know that along with everyone in our government, we remain committed to ensuring that all of Ontario is allowed to move forward. I know that the situation in Windsor Essex is of great interest to you, and as the Chief Medical Officer of Health stated yesterday, we are seeing progress, but more oversight is required. And I know that the spread of COVID in our agriculture sector continues to be an issue for you and our government, and we're continually closely monitoring and to address the situation. Speaker, can the Premier share more about the actions our government is taking to ensure that Windsor-Essex is ready to move forward to stage two as soon as possible? Premier. Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure everyone in this House, the people of Windsor-Essex, that we are doing everything in our power to make sure we reopen that, that region there. You know, Mr. Speaker, I've been on the phone with the farmers last night, on the, on the phone this morning, on the phone with Omafra, our, our health table, our chief medical officer of health, and I, I, I believe everyone's coming together 
that we'll, we'll have uh, an agreement that we can move forward, a mutually rewarding agreement that will help out the people of Windsor-Essex, the people, the, the farmers and, and the workers. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I feel terrible. I, you know, I, I feel terrible for the people of Windsor-Essex that they're going through this, and I feel terrible for the farmers and, and along with the workers. But we're coming up with a solution, Mr. Speaker, that is going to benefit every single person. I want to give a shout out to the Response. farmers. I support them 100 percent, and we're going to get through this together. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetong. Um, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, uh, question to the Premier. The, cor the correctional system across Ontario is a factory that produces broken Indigenous people that are sent back to our uh, communities or left to fend for themselves on the streets of big cities, then back to in jail as a vicious cycle without an end, Mr. Speaker. These systems dehumanize our young people, young men, young women, but these young people are more than just charges they face or their sentences. This includes my nephew, Kevin. He died three weeks ago while he was in jail custody at the Thunder Bay District Jail. Another young Indigenous man uh, died at the same jail in recent weeks. Nine have died since 2002. Seven were Indigenous men. Like Kevin, these young people are our sons, our fathers, and nephews. The Human Rights Commissioner, Coners and Quests, the Grand Chief of Nisnabaski Nation, even my brother, have all called for this jail to close. How many more Indigenous people need to die at the Thunder Bay Jail before the government takes action? to solve this crisis. The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. And as we discussed a number of weeks ago, I committed to you that when the investigation was complete, all information that we are able to share with the family will be shared. I know that these are tragedies that we must do better. But when deaths occur in our corrections facility, there are very strict guidelines that must happen. It starts with an internal investigation. It continues with the coroner's investigation, and if um, necessary, a police investigation. The commitment that our government has made to announce and re-announce the Thunder Bay Jail is on the table. We have made that commitment in 2019. We are working with the community, with the corrections officers, and with our justice partners to make sure that the facility that we build in Thunder Bay, that we need in Thunder Bay, will be appropriate for the community, for the uh, workers that work there, and for the inmates that are serving. It is important that we do this work now so that we don't re-make mistakes that have happened where we build quickly but build poorly. We are making the investment upfront to consult and Response. work with the individuals in the justice sector and the correction side to make sure that we get it right, and we will do that, and you have my commitment that we will do that. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Good speaker, uh, most of the Indigenous men and women who go through the system do not belong in jails. They've suffered uh, years and even generations of trauma and extreme poverty. They need access to proper education, access to their cultural teachings, access to clean drinking water, houses fit and to live, health and mental health supports when they need it. They do not belong in jail. The Thunder Bay Jail should close, Mr. Speaker, but the problem cannot be fixed by simply creating a bigger jail, a newer jail, that will fill with even more Indigenous people. The shift must uh, happen across systems that addresses the underlying issues of colonialism that's, that ripped children away from our families and brought us to where we are today. Sometimes, actually, 
It's called systemic racism. What does the Premier plan to do that no more families will see their children, children's body flown away from home for another autopsy? Again, the Solicitor General to reply. You know, I, I couldn't agree more with the member opposite. It is not an issue that only the Solicitor General Ministry is working on. It is an issue that all of our governments, all of our legislators must work together to resolve. In the meantime, we are doing what we can in the Solicitor General on, in corrections to provide a safe environment and culturally appropriate services to individuals within our custody. Indigenous programming and services are provided at all our institutions, including the Thunder Bay Jail, that aim to address barriers Indigenous inmates face while honouring their histories, traditions, heritage, beliefs and cultures. Core programs and services are offered and facilitated by elders, native inmate liaison officers, community corrections workers, as well as other Indigenous staff and service providers. I know that across government, we can do better, but we are doing what we can in corrections to make sure that we provide the appropriate services when needed. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Last Friday, the minister laid out three options for return to school come September. He told the 72 school boards to prepare for all three, fully open schools, continuation of full online learning, and partly open schools. And then over the weekend, the minister said that, in fact, boards had to be ready to impl implement the least workable option, the part-time school, for the beginning of September. Here's the reaction of a parent who wrote to both the minister and to me, a parent of a JK student, and one of many that uh, I've heard from since the announcement the minister made, and I quote, For families with two working families like mine, we cannot sustain part-time in-person schooling. We will need childcare for our children when school is not in person. That means that many children would be in various part-time daycares with babysitters and or grandparents on the days they are not in school, which completely invalidates the logic behind small cohorts. Not only is this plan not sustainable for families that financially require parents, caregivers to do paid work, particularly worrisome for single parents, Parents, it is not optimal for keeping the children or the community safe via limited contact." Unquote. If the minister's objective was to support children's learning and safety and to support the opening of the economy, why did he choose the model that is absolutely designed to fail on both counts? Minister of Education to reply. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much to the members opposite for the question. Um, speaker, indeed, we did unveil last Friday uh, three options for school boards to be ready. Because, Speaker, what we've learned from this pandemic is we must be ready. Students deserve to learn, no matter what the circumstance and difficulty that manifests on the horizon. So we've asked boards to be ready for in-class day-to-day instruction with enhanced protocols. Yes, with a remote online option and a third option of blended. What I said, Speaker, Friday, as I reaffirmed Saturday, as I will affirm in this House today, is that based on the modeling and the advice of the chief medical officer, Sick Kids Hospital, some of the best pediatric doctors in this country. Their advice is today to proceed with an adaptive model. Of course, we know in this reality it is fluid, which is why we're asking boards to be ready for all circumstances for the reopening. In addition to that, we've enhanced it with we've provided enhanced cleaning supports, $730 million more dollars for school boards to be prepared for a positive start, including in mental health and technology. We'll continue to invest more Response. in our students in every board in Ontario to ensure September is a positive restart for all kids in Ontario. And the supplementary question. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the minister's answer. I have heard the announcements. I have listened very carefully to what he's been saying. My concern is that I do not believe, and this is because of conversations that I've had with leadership of the federations and the unions, I do not believe that the conversation with the people who are going to be in those classrooms, who understand exactly what needs to happen, I do not believe those conversations are happening. I think, Mr. Speaker, that there are other options. The, ed the education unions and federations have all made recommendations to the minister and for example a fourth option could be developed but it would take collaboration real collaboration with teachers with support staff with students parents and administrators and it could allow the full full opening of schools but it would take the government working with those partners, providing additional funding to have smaller groupings of students in schools, but also in community space, also in commercial space and other public space in the community. It would require Question. funding for outdoor classrooms, but it would allow staff 
to connect with the community and have more outdoor learning. Other jurisdictions like Denmark have been doing just this. Can the minister explain why this model that would require additional funding or some version of it is not an option for Ontario's children? Thank you. Minister of Education once again to reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on Friday and in the days preceding, we announced a plan to invest more money in the public education than any government in the history of Ontario. And, Speaker, we're investing an additional $10 million. In fact, under the former Liberal government, when, when the member opposite was Premier, Order. they're investing just shy of $20 million. I'm proud to report, Speaker, we're investing over $40 million in mental health to support the resiliency and strength of every child in the province. In technology, an area of mutual interest, I hope, I would expect, we are investing an additional $15 million to procure upwards of 35,000 Chromebooks and tablets for at-risk students so that their families have access to technology. We're investing more money for cleaning. In fact, in our announcement on Friday, over $730 million more dollars in public education. Every school board in the province of Ontario, including the Toronto Public and Catholic, is receiving more money to ensure a safe, positive restart this September. Mr. Speaker, yes, it will require investment. It will require cooperation. Our government will continue to be guided by the advice of the Chief Medical Response. Officer of Health, continue to listen to parents, students, and educators on the best way to, yes, get students in class in September. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. I know that Ontario has one of the best wildland fire management systems in the world, but we saw earlier this year when Australia faced a busy wildfire season, and we're seeing it now as Ontario has sent support to Quebec to help combat a fire in Lac Saint-Jean region that we need to be ready and we need to support our communities. In typical, Cana typical Canadian fashion, we have our governments responded by providing personnel to assist with critical functions to support our neighbours and their firefighting efforts. Can the minister share how his ministry is preparing and is helping fire personnel be prepared to keep Ontarians safe during this wildland fire season? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. I want to uh, thank the amazing member for Durham from, from, from Durham for that question. You know, our government acted quickly, and I am so proud of the that our firefighting system is recognized as among the best, if not the best, in the entire world. And we acted quickly this year to ensure that we could protect people and property uh, and our firefighters under the COVID uh, situation. We first we enacted an early fire ban which protected those workers because they were getting prepared for a very unique season. So we had an early fire ban that was really, really helpful in keeping those fires out, uh, out in the early season. We increased the base budget for firefighting this year by $30 million. And to protect our staff, we ensured that they had the prepar preparation and the planning and the training for physical distancing, as well as self-assessment tools that they must do uh, each and every day. Speaker, our aviation, forest fire, emergency services is among the best in the world, and we are making sure that we will keep it that way. And while we're doing that, we will ensure that the protection of people and property in the province of Ontario continues to be our number one priority. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister on behalf of Ontarians for these smart, balanced measures to keep our natural resources people and property safe during this challenging time. With the first official day of summer just behind us, Ontarians are looking to enjoy the great outdoors, whether that's camping or cottaging or hunting, fishing and hiking. And of course, we all enjoy a good campfire. Um, Ontarians want to be able to relax around a good fire in a way that's safe and enjoyable. So can the minister please tell us what's he, what he's doing uh, to make sure that Ontarians are able to safely enjoy fires. Minister of Natural Resources Thank you again and for Forestry. The, uh, for the question, and as I said, we increased the firefighting budget by $30 million this year. In addition to the amazing fire force, fire rangers that we have in this province, we also have a fleet of 30 aircraft that are, as I say, one of the unique systems in all of the world. We have our water bombers, our twin otters, and our helicopters. And we employed a different strategy this year because of COVID that we wanted to make sure we kept our forest fires small and hit them hard, hit them early and hit them hard. As a result, as of yesterday, Ontario has had 151 wildland fires this year, 
burning 892 hectares. This is well below the 10-year average of 285 fires and 56,604 hectares burned as of this date. So our strategy has worked. It is working, but we are now into the mid we're into summer. And I want to ensure Response. everybody that our people are ready, including to help our neighbours in Quebec. But we also have a responsibility to be as diligent and vigilant as possible to ensure that we can prevent as many forest fires as possible to make sure that our, the great people that work for us in MNRF. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Three migrant workers have now died of COVID-19 in Ontario. Benefacio Eugenio Romero and Rogelio Munoz Santos died while working in Essex County. There are countless others that, who are sick. The Premier has sat back and watched while the case numbers have grown among this vulnerable population. Despite pleas from local leaders and public health officials for increased resources and a plan, the province has done nothing but say, we feel bad. Now the outbreaks have spread, but we still don't know the full scope of the issue. The Premier spent this week blaming Order. farmers, blaming Ottawa, blaming everyone but himself. It's time that he took a long, hard look in the mirror, because other provinces have avoided the outbreaks that we're seeing in Ontario. This lands squarely on the shoulders of the Premier. Speaker, people in my riding are understandably angry about how this has been handled. Why did the Premier allow this to happen, Question. and what metrics did he use when de deciding to keep us in stage one? The Minister of Labour. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member opposite for this question. I want to begin uh, by saying to uh, all of those workers impacted by uh, COVID-19, uh, our government sends our sincerest uh, sympathies and condolences uh, to all of those uh, families. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, to, to the family of Mr. Romero, to the uh, family of Mr. Chaparro, and to the family of uh, Mr. Santos, uh, I want to send uh, specific regards from me uh, to their families. Uh, they're facing, obviously, uh, just a tragedy, and uh, we're going to be with them uh, every step of the way through this. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, I launched a blitz of the uh, farming sector uh, back in April, and, Mr. Speaker, we've done uh, over 230 investigations, and we've uh, issued 70 orders to uh, improve health and safety for workers on farms across this province. And as the member opposite knows, uh, yesterday uh, I joined the Premier uh, to announce uh, a partnership between the federal government, between us and local health units to begin uh, investigating uh, living quarters uh, for these workers. And I'll talk about more in my supplementary. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, to the minister, respectfully, condolences don't stop people from getting sick or from dying. What our region needs is funding, we need policy and enforcement, and we need to make sure that these workers have appropriate living and working conditions. Right. Full stop. Not your condolences. <laughs> Windsor Regional Hospital recently announced that there was no one with COVID in the ICU or on ventilators or in hospital in Windsor. The field hospital has been shut down. Chatham is closer to the rural areas of Essex County than the city of Windsor, and yet they've been open for weeks. Toronto and Peel have higher numbers, and they are opening. Speaker, we respect public health direction, but it is very difficult for my constituents to understand this decision without transparency. My constituents are at their wits' end with the prolonged closure. The Windsor-Essex Chamber has called for immediate financial relief for our local businesses, saying that it would be, quote, catastrophic for our region without it. This morning, the FAO reports that Windsor is the hardest-hit city by pandemic-related job losses at 19 per cent. To the Premier, I will ask again, what metrics did you use when deciding to keep us at stage one? What are you going to do to support the people who have so much to lose from this decision? Again, Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, as the Premier indicated earlier in question period and yesterday at his press conference, uh, there's no one that wants Windsor-Essex uh, open more than uh, the government of Ontario to help those small businesses, those families, and those workers uh, across that region. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, but to the first part of the question, I do want to address 
um, uh, the migrant worker uh, issue. The health and safety of every worker, including those in the agricultural sector, uh, is our top priority. The member opposite knows that when it comes to the temporary foreign worker program and the living quarters uh, for those workers, that's the responsibility uh, of the federal government. But I'm proud that we are working together, the federal government, the provincial government, local health units, to get in there and inspect those uh, living quarters to improve those conditions uh, for workers. My responsibility as Ministry, as Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Response. Development is to inspect workplaces. And I'm proud to say we've inspected 231 farms. We've issued uh, 70 orders to improve conditions for those workers uh, and every worker in the agricultural sector. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Guelph. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Seasonal migrant farm workers are essential workers, and tragically now three workers have died from COVID-19. While I'm sure their families appreciate the minister's condolences, we need to talk about the two-tier system for worker protections in this province. Seasonal farm workers are not entitled to many of the protections in the Employment Standards Act. Many of them are afraid afraid to speak out about unsanitary housing conditions, afraid to speak out about unsafe labor conditions and lack of PPE, and the loss of wages if they test positive. No wonder many of them don't want to be tested. And I realize the Premier keeps saying, farmers, get your workers tested. Migrant farm workers get tested. But the bottom line is BC developed a program that paid workers why they were quarantined. Many of these workers are afraid of deportation and loss of Question. wages if they, are, if they test positive. Will the minister guarantee that they will not lose, migrant farm workers will not lose their wages if they test positive for COVID-19? Thank you. Once again, the Minister of Labour to reply. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as a member opposite knows, that the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act applies to every single worker in the province of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, furthermore, to my uh, earlier uh, answer, uh, our ministry has provided uh, now eight health and safety guidelines for uh, agricultural businesses and farms across the province. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that four of those has, have been uh, translated uh, into Spanish. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, we have uh, 500 inspectors going to workplaces right across this uh, province, including uh, farms and agricultural businesses. Uh, I've been uh, assured, and I know that uh, these inspectors also have translators with them, so they're talking to uh, uh, migrant workers that have a, a Spanish uh, background, Response. Mr. Speaker. Uh, so far uh, in Ontario, I'm proud to say during the COVID-19 crisis, we've inspected nearly 12,000 workplaces. Uh, we've issued uh, nearly 7,000 orders, and I've shut down 23 workplaces in this province. The supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect to the minister, migrant farm workers need to be assured that they will be protected if they report unsafe work and living conditions. When this outbreak started, I met with farmers who told me how vital and essential temporary migrant farm workers are to feeding Ontarians. I also talked to many farmers who said, you know what? We need more support to improve living conditions in bunkhouses. We need support to ensure that our workers have access to PPE. I've talked to advocates for migrant farm workers who say workers are afraid to speak out because they might be deported and they might lose their wages. And so the real question is, if we want to solve this problem, we have to protect worker rights. Question. And so will the minister guarantee to migrant farm workers that they will not lose their wages if they test positive for COVID-19? Thank you. Again, the Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want every worker in the province of Ontario to know that I will uh, stand with them uh, every step of the way. We will not tolerate uh, employers uh, not treating employees uh, properly. 
Uh, the laws are in place through the Employment Standards Act and the Occupational Health and Safety Act. But, Mr. Speaker, one of the announcements that uh, my colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, made uh, a number of weeks ago was an investment of $15 million to better protect farm workers uh, in the province of Ontario, to buy more PPE, to improve housing, to improve transportation. And, Mr. Speaker, I don't need to remind any member in this legislature the very first piece of legislation that we passed during COVID-19, Bill 186, it protects every single worker in this province, including migrant workers, Mr. Speaker. If they're in Response. quarantine, if they're in self-isolation, if they have to stay home and look after a loved one because the schools are closed, they will not lose their job. They cannot be fired. I will stand with every worker in this province. Thank you. Lord. The next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Mr. Speaker, our government's safe and responsible approach of phased reopenings throughout the province has meant that day after day, more and more businesses can begin to open up their communities to visitors and generate much needed revenues. This is especially important for Ontario's tourism industry, which, as the minister described it, was one of the hardest hit industry that will take the longest to recover. Mr. Speaker, I know that the minister has taken a keen interest in visiting all corners of the province as they begin to reopen. In fact, I know she was proud to begin these visits with her, with her hometown of Ottawa as it opened up for stage two earlier this month. I know that just this past week, the minister was in Niagara Falls to help reopen Canada's number one tourist Question. destination. Can the minister please update this house on the significance of this reopening and what it means for both Niagara's tourism operators and Ontarians who are looking to visit? Thank you. The Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industry. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for his question, but mostly for his interest in this industry. Uh, I'd also like to start uh, just by saying thank you to Premier Ford. Almost a year ago, just over a year ago, he appointed me to this ministry, and I would like to thank those in my ministry, as well as our 18 agencies and attractions, as well as all of those stakeholders and industry partners, particularly as they've gone through the last four months. Uh, the member opposite is right. I did take, undertake a province-wide tour starting in Ottawa, then to the Thousand Islands. I went up to Muskoka over to Blue Mountain, and then, of course, on Friday, I spent some time in the Niagara region. I often say that this ministry is responsible for a spectacular double bottom line. First, it looks at uh, improving our cultural fabric in the province of Ontario while driving a $75 billion economy. Um, however, over the past number of months, we have faced a triple threat, the health care crisis, the economic crisis, and, Speaker, the social crisis. Response. As a result of that crisis, we are seeing, seeing consumer behaviours inhibited, and that has driven um, a, a real stake in the heart of this suite of sectors and industries, and I'll be happy to talk a little bit about, about what we did in, ter in terms of that tour and what we hope to accomplish with our marketing dollars in the supplemental. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It looks like Ontarians will have plenty of reasons to visit Niagara both this summer and in the future as we anticipate our government's $25 million commitment to redevelop the Canadian Niagara Power Generating Station. In keeping with news around the theme of welcoming back visitors across Ontario, I know many of my constituents were thrilled to hear Premier Ford announce that even more of our province will be able to reopen this week. Mr. Speaker, as of June 24, parts of our province, including Peel and Toronto, will be able to open up more of their services and attractions to visitors and residents. This is wonderful news for the region and for Ontario's 36 billion tourism industry. Can the minister please update this house on this good news and please explain how our government plans to visit and promote all these newly opened regions to show to show Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> minister Heritage replied. Thank you very much, Speaker, and again, thank you for the question. Uh, our government is committed to ensuring that the, the economy opens gradually and safely. Uh, that said, just because we flick the switch does not necessarily mean our visitor economy will return uh, at any time soon, which is why our government has invested $13 million in supporting a hyperlocal 
uh, tourism initiative so we can start to reconnect within our own communities. I want to make sure that we demonstrate the safety uh, of going to these cultural and tourism attractions, which is why we have embarked on that tour across Ontario to demonstrate that it's safe to stay at the Holiday Inn Express in Gananoque. It is safe to visit Santa's Village in Bracebridge. It is safe to go on a walking tour with the haunted walks in Ottawa. It is safe to take the Sky Wheel in Niagara. And, Speaker, it will be safe to go through Toronto this week and, God willing, safe to go through a Windsor and Essex uh, once it is cleared for phase two. Speaker, we have a, a long Response. road ahead of us, but I think it's important for each member of this assembly to take leadership in their own communities to start getting Ontarians to reconnect in their each, uh, each one of their ridings. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, since the beginning of this pandemic, public health experts have all agreed on measures to flatten the curve. Wash your hands, maintain physical distancing, and stay home if you are sick. For many workers without paid sick days, staying home was their only option because their non-essential workplace was shut down. Now, as the economy reopens, it will be almost impossible for low-wage workers like those in retail or hospitality to stay home to recover or wait for the results of a COVID test when that means even more financial hardship. Speaker, how does the Premier expect to prevent a deadly second wave of the virus if workers can't afford to stay home when they are sick? Minister of Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, I'm proud to say that the very first piece of legislation that uh, we passed uh, during this uh, global pandemic uh, here in Ontario was Bill 186. That piece of legislation amended the Employment Standards Act, uh, which tells people uh, if they are in self-isolation, if they're in quarantine, uh, if they have to stay home and look after uh, a loved one, for example, a child, because uh, the schools are shut down, uh, Mr. Speaker, that they can't be fired uh, for that. That, uh, that change, Mr. Speaker, will last until COVID-19 uh, is defeated. Uh, here in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, uh, we're going to continue to protect uh, the health and safety uh, of every work in the province, help families, help businesses get through uh, this uh, uh, global pandemic and ensure that we come out of this stronger than ever. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the federal government, pushed by NDP leader Jigmeet Singh, has recognized that there is a vital public interest in providing paid sick days so that workers can stay home when they are sick without giving up their wages. Especially in a pandemic, the cost of paid sick days should not just be the responsibility of hard-hit employers. Government must come to the table as well. That's why the federal government proposed to work with the provinces on a paid sick leave program. Program. Speakers, when other provinces and territories have welcomed the federal initiative, can the Premier explain why he doesn't believe in paid sick days against the advice of almost all public health experts and why he is refusing to develop a paid sick leave program? Mr. Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much and thank you to the member from London West uh, for that question. Mr. Speaker, uh, we continue to uh, listen to workers, uh, with labour leaders, uh, with employers uh, right across this province. Uh, obviously, the global pandemic has uh, clearly disrupted uh, Ontario. Uh, in March and April alone, Mr. Speaker, 1.2 million people uh, were out of work. But, Mr. Speaker, we moved quickly and decisively at the beginning of the pandemic to pass Bill uh, 186 to uh, tell those people that they can't be fired because of COVID-19. And, Mr. Speaker, we, we're taking uh, every uh, measure necessary to ensure that people have a job coming out of COVID-19 as we enter the recovery phase, that businesses are able to uh, unlock their doors, reopen their places of business, and hire people back. Mr. Speaker, uh, when it comes to protecting uh, health and safety, Response. I think it's worth uh, mentioning we've invested heavily throughout COVID-19 uh, to double the capacity of the Health and Safety uh, Action Centre. If any work worker feels unsafe at work, they can call 877-202-0008. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, last Friday I was thrilled to see the Minister announce funding for the 2020-21 school year, which is $736 million more than last year. 
I know that our priorities are in the right place on student success and well-being. And on the latter, it is more important than ever to make sure that our kids can receive the mental health support that they need. School boards, students, parents in my riding will welcome our government's increased funding for mental health. Can the minister please outline how these funds will support our students as they prepare to return to school in September? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Allow me to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for her leadership and for her advocacy for more supports for mental health and special education in the province of Ontario. Indeed, Speaker, I was proud to join the Premier uh, last week to announce new investments to support mental health and the resiliency of our kids. We know that COVID-19 has had a great impact on their strength and on their ability to uh, continue on in learning. We know that this, is, this isolation has an impact on their social emotional learning. And it's why, Speaker, our government more than doubled mental health funding last year. It's why this year, for September, we're adding an ancillary investment of $10 million. That brings the mental health and well-being grant to the province of Ontario to $75 million. In the members' riding and in the, for Toronto public, for example, uh, that's an additional $10 million. Uh, or rather a $10 million investment being provided to that board to help them hire more psychologists, more psychotherapists and social workers to help our children, our families and our entire community Spons. get through the difficulty of this outbreak. And the supplementary question. To the minister for that answer. I know from speaking with them that many parents of special needs students are especially concerned for student well-being during this period of uncertainty. We put in place increased supports for special needs students during distance learning, and we continue to invest to support them. The Toronto Catholic District School Board, which operates in my riding, will receive close to $128 million in special education funding in 2020-21, an increase over last year. Can the minister please share further details on how our government is supporting special needs students in Ontario? Again, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. Speaker, indeed, the government is continuing to invest more in special education. It is this progressive Conservative government that will increase investment in SPECAD to the highest levels ever recorded in Ontario history to $3.2 billion. Speaker, we are more than doubling the mental health portfolio to over $40 million. When you look at the agreements we reach with our union, with the union federations and our partners, $212 million for the new Support for Students Fund. That is a fund that is designed to focus on hiring staff that actually meet the needs of our parents and our kids. More in spec ed, more in mental health and in STEM education, Speaker. Obviously, part of our commitment for September is to make sure that IEPs and IPRCs continue to be followed by school boards and that school boards provide a check-in ahead of the start of the year to ensure families have the resource, the technology and the response they need so that their child can have dignity, opportunity and succeed this September. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, the national media exposed the horrific toll on the lives of injured workers that was brought on by Ontario Workmen's Compensation Board. The report documented that the WSIB was forcing injured workers back to work, in some cases within days of injuries. It showed that they were pay paying for opioids to deal with the pain of working while still injured, but only long enough to get them addicted before they cut them off compensation and they were denying them recommended treatments and surgery for injured workers. And while the WSAB was doing this to workers, your government was standing by and doing nothing. Will this government admit that they have failed injured workers, that the WSIB is broken, and finally direct the WSIB to provide proper respect and compensation for injured workers in the province of Ontario? Minister of Labour. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Niagara for that uh, question here this morning. Mr. Speaker, uh, first I want to begin by uh, you know, just telling all those injured workers uh, out there across the province, uh, I want to send them my condolences and sympathies. Uh, we're working uh, every single day, Mr. Speaker, to make this system better. Uh, as the member opposite knows, uh, the WSIB is currently uh, undergoing an operational uh, review, which I'll be making uh, public uh, very soon, Mr. Speaker, and making uh, some changes to 
uh, further uh, strengthen the WSIB system and, and help workers uh, across the province. Mr. Speaker, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of uh, serving under Premier Ford and in this government is the fact that together, in partnership with the federal government, we're going to be investing $3.8 billion into mental health and addictions uh, across the province to help workers, to help families, to help every single person dealing with mental health and addictions issues. Thank you. And the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the President of the United Steelworkers said, these tragedies are not surprising to anyone who has ever advocated for injured workers. People have been trying to tell this government for years that the WSIB is broken and failing injured workers. In many cases, and listen to this, Minister, condemning them to a life of poverty, whether it's through deeming, denying COVID-19 claims of our frontline heroes, and now finding out their actions have been fueled by an opioid crisis. The WSIB under this government is broken. You can fix some of these wrongdoings today. Will you commit to support two bills I have, have tabled before you? One, end deeming, and one to provide every frontline worker, our heroes, who catches COVID-19 with resumptive coverage so they can get the benefits Question. they need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Labor to reply. Again, to the member opposite, thank you so much uh, for these questions this morning and for the uh, pieces of legislation uh, that he has tabled. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we continue to review uh, all options and uh, will obviously uh, consider uh, any legislation that's tabled uh, in this House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, like the member opposite, I too want to pay tribute to every single hero in this province that have been uh, working through this uh, pandemic that's impacted uh, Ontario, from the healthcare workers to the grocery store clerks to the sales associates at hardware stores, Mr. Speaker, uh, to the pharmacists. Uh, there are millions and millions of unsung heroes in this province who have gotten uh, communities and families uh, through this pandemic. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, specifically, uh, as I answered in the first question, uh, the WSIB is undergoing a uh, operational review. It's a system that we inherited, obviously, after 15 years uh, in opposition, but I look forward to further strengthening the WSIB system for every worker in the province of Ontario. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. There are no deferred votes. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.